Hello everybody, uh, welcome along. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, you're listening to your host, Kate Matcham, the Marketing Executive at Stanford Global, the company responsible for the Human Asset Summit Series and the operator of the HCM Excellence Network. And it's my absolute pleasure to present to you today Dr. Marshall Goldsmith. Uh, Marshall is a world leading executive coach author and editor of 31 books, including the bestsellers Mojo and What Got You Here Won't Get You There, and the recipient of numerous professional acknowledgements and awards, including recently being recognised as the number one leadership thinker in the world at the Harvard Business Review Thinkers 50 ceremony. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to Marshall for his presentation, Creating a New Identity. Thank you, Marshall. I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, my name is Marshall Goldsmith. I will briefly introduce myself and we will begin. Uh, I'm from a small town in the state of Kentucky in the United States called Valley Station, Kentucky. I went to undergraduate engineering school, got an MBA, then got a PhD at UCLA. I was a college professor and dean when I was very young. And then for the last well, 35 years, I've been doing three things. One is I give talks or teach classes sort of like today, which is what I enjoy doing the most. I love speaking and teaching. A second is I write and edit books and articles, and I have edited or written, as was mentioned, 32 books. Uh, my biggest selling books are called Mojo and What Got You Here Won't Get You There. Those are both New York Times bestsellers. And then the third thing I do is coach executives. That's what I'm most famous for. And in my coaching, I work with CEOs or could be CEOs of big companies. Most of my coaching clients are the CEOs or could be CEOs of large corporations, but I also do a lot of volunteer work. So I'm the coach for the CEO of the Nature Conservancy, that's the world's largest conservation organization, uh, the World Bank, which is really focused on eradicating human poverty, uh, the United States Agency for International Development, um, the New York Public Library, and then yesterday I was at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota which is one of the world's top hospital chains, or hospital uh, systems. So I've really um, got a fascinating job. Uh, and I, I'm a Buddhist, so I give all my material away. If you go to www.marshallgoldsmith.com, you can get all of my material. You may copy, share, download, duplicate, use in church, use in charity, use any of my material any way you wish. And then also, I love getting emails. My email address is marshall, M-A-R-S-H-A-L-L, -L, at marshallgoldsmith.com. Please send me an email anytime. I love getting emails. I will apologize in advance. If you do send me an email, I cannot get back to you immediately, but I always get back to people eventually. It may take a little while, but I always get back to people. Now, what are our goals today? Goal number one, we're going to discuss the most important variable in successful leadership development, employee engagement, executive coaching is the person, not the teacher book or program. And this is a very different philosophy than is covered in most writing in our field. We're going to talk about the understand the sources of our identity and how our identity impacts our behavior. And then um, how identity also impacts coaching how identity over the years I've become to realize is a key factor in the coaching process. So we're going to talk about a few key topics today, a little bit different than what I'm going to be discussing when I'm working in Hungary, or excuse me, in Budapest. Um, first, it's about you, not the coach program or book. I've had the privilege of working with many great leaders, and as an executive coach, I have a very unique coaching philosophy. I do not get paid if my clients do not get better. Better is not judged by me. Better is not judged by my client. Better is judged by everyone around my client. There's always a good way to test if someone actually believes what they're teaching you. You can ask them one very simple question to measure their belief. What is that question? Do you want to bet on it? If they say, I believe it, but I wouldn't bet on it, you know what you've learned? They really do not believe it that much. They say, here's the money. They pretty much believe it. So this is something I bet on every time. Now, if you look at the coaching process, what have I learned? The client that I coach that I spent the least amount of time with is the client who improved the most. The client I spent the most amount of time with did not improve at all, and I did not get paid. This is a very humbling lesson. I did um, 
a little chart, and on one dimension it was called Time Spent with Marshall Goldsmith, and the other dimension was called Got Better. And there was a clear negative correlation between spending time with me and getting better. Well, I thought, this is a humbling chart. So I talked to the client who I coached to improve the most, who was fantastic to start with, one of the great leaders in the world. And I asked him, what should I learn about coaching from you? His name is Alan Mulally. Alan is the CEO of the Ford Motor Company, was the CEO of the year in the United States last year, and has done a spectacular job of turning the company around from a very, very difficult situation. I said, Alan, what should I learn about coaching from you? He said, Marshall, your biggest challenge as a coach is called customer selection. He said, if you pick the right customer, your coaching always works. And if you pick the wrong customer, your coaching never works. And he said, my job is not that different. As a leader, um, I have to have great people. He said, I do not design the car. I do not build the car. I don't sell the car. I have to have great people, or else I will not be a success. And he said, second, don't make the coaching process about yourself or your own ego or how smart you are. Make it about the great people you coach and how hard they work. Well, these are such great learnings that most of us never deeply understand. Most of us spend our lives trying to change people who don't really care about changing, and then we wonder why they don't get better. Well, they don't get better because they don't care. Uh, when, when my book, uh, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, was the number one best-selling business book in the United States. The number one best-selling diet book in the United States sold 10 times as many copies. Americans get fatter and fatter and fatter while buying more and more diet books. Well, you don't lose weight because you buy a diet book. You actually have to go on a diet. Well, I should have called my book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, Diet. I might have sold some more copies. Well, the great myth in my field of leadership development is if people understand, they will do. Well, you know what I've learned in life? Our problem as leaders is not understanding the practice of leadership. Most of us do understand the practice of leadership. My good friends Jim Cousas and Barry Posner wrote a great book called The Leadership Challenge 25 years ago that described a great leader. Well, most of what they wrote is totally valid today. Most of us understand the practice of leadership. We do not practice our understanding of leadership. It's not knowing what to do that's a challenge of life. It's doing it. Now, what matters in life? I have done at my home in California three sessions with 11 retiring CEOs. And we talk about what matters in life. And these are people that are looking to go to the next phase of life. I'm 63. They're people who are about my age. And five key factors come up in terms of what matters the most. The first is health. If we don't have health, the rest of the stuff doesn't matter too much. Um, second, wealth. But wealth matters less than you might imagine. Um, if you look at studies on wealth in almost any country in the world, wealth does go up, oh, happiness does go up with wealth to a point. But the point is not as high as you might imagine. Typically in most countries, if you have a middle or upper middle class income, beyond that, there's absolutely no correlation between wealth and happiness. The one myth is that rich people are miserable. No, that's not true. Second myth is rich people are happy. That's not true. Rich people are really no happier or more miserable than poor people. A great uh, book called Stumbling on Happiness by uh, Daniel Gilbert talks about this. And he points out that people that win the lottery a year later or, or five years later are not that much happier, and people who become quadriplegic are not that much less happy. Most of our happiness comes from the inside. Wealth matters to a point, but beyond that, it doesn't matter much. The third thing that almost always matters is relationships, having positive relationships with people we love. And in our research for the book Mojo, we found out that people who said, I spend more hours a week with people I love, uh, had higher overall satisfaction with life at home. That was not surprising. What was more surprising, they had over, higher overall satisfaction with life at work. So relationships kind of carry over through life. Now, assuming that you're healthy and you have at least a middle class level of wealth, which most of the listeners in this, in this um, webinar probably do, and assuming that you have good relationships with people that you love, all that matters in life, happiness and meaning. 
Am I doing what makes me happy? And I, am I doing what's meaningful for me? And what we've learned about happiness and meaning is they can only be defined from the inside, not from the outside. No one can tell you what makes you happy. And no one can tell you what's meaningful for you. Those have to come from inside us. Now, in my book, Mojo, I talk about that Mojo is that positive spirit toward what you are doing now that starts from the inside and radiates to the outside. And we see this constantly as we journey through life. Uh, I fly all the time. On American Airlines alone, I have over 10 million frequent flyer miles. There are two flight attendants on the plane. One is positive, motivated, upbeat, and enthusiastic. One is negative, bitter, angry, and cynical. They're on the same plane at the same time with the same pay in the same uniform, and they have the same customers. What's the difference? Well, the difference is not what's on the outside. The difference is what's on the inside. And as I get to the end of the presentation, I'm going to share our new work on employee engagement just a little bit and give you a technique that really can help build your own mojo and increase your own engagement and share the new research that we've done on some very simple ways to do that. Our mojo is a function of person. Some people tend to have more than others. The activity, the same person will have different amounts with different activities and the time. The same person on the same activity may have different amounts at different points in time. And again, this constantly changes as we journey through life. It comes from the inside. It doesn't come from the outside. Now, our mojo, that positive spirit of what we're doing, is important at work and it's important at home. Think about it. Of the people we respect at work. If we come across, a, I'm motivated, I'm enthusiastic, I find this work to be meaningful, it makes me happy, what message do we send to them? This matters, it's important, it counts. Uh, at home, it's even more important. What message do we send to people? What message do we send to people when we come home and the message is, I'm tired, I really don't want to be here, uh, I'm bitter, well, the message to those people that we love at home may be, you know what, you're not that important. I'd rather be someplace else. And by the way, being around you does not make me happy. It's interesting. I've asked thousands of parents this question from around the world. I say, um, give me one word to finish the sentence. When my child grows up, I want my child to be. The number one word around the world, more than every other word combined, is the word Happy. Happy. Well, what I try to teach people is you want your children to be happy. You want your parents to be happy. You want the people that love you to be happy. Do you want the people that respect you to work at work to be happy? You go first. You be happy. And again, we often don't think of our own mojo, our own sense of happiness and meaning as how this impacts not only our own lives, but the lives of other people around us. Now, Four factors impact our mojo, that's our identity. And our identity is the way we define ourselves. Who is the me and me? If mojo is that positive spirit toward what you are doing that starts from the inside and radiates to the outside, who is the you and you? Reputation, that's how other people see us. Achievement, that's what we accomplish. And acceptance, that's our ability to accept what's going on around us in life. So we're going to focus today largely on identity. But we're going to focus a little bit, a little bit on the concept of reputation. Now, uh, let's talk about the sources of our identity. Our identity comes from the intersection of the past and the future. And it's how we see ourselves and our identity is how other people can see us. Now, it's influenced by how we see ourselves, but also the input we receive from others. If we look at what I call our identity matrix, we can see where identity comes from. And I'll talk about each of the elements. The first element of our identity is called our remembered identity, our remembered identity. Now, how do we know who we are? Well, one of the ways we know who we are is our memories. Other, uh, the way we see ourselves in the past. For example, uh, I think I'm a bad tennis player. How do I know I'm a bad tennis player? Well, I remember losing tennis matches. And these memories, they become part of my identity. So a lot of our identity is 
our own recollections of the past, what we remember about ourselves, and these memories, they, they uh, go on to be a big part of who we are. The second part of our identity is called our reflected identity. Now, our if reflected identity is how other people see us, and they tell us about the past. For example, if part of your identity is, I am a bad listener, okay, how do you know you are a bad listener? Well, in the past, people probably told you that you didn't listen well, and these reflections from our past, these comments from other people become part of our identity and the way we start defining ourselves as a human being. Uh, the third part of our identity, I'm going to spend more time on this one, is called our programmed identity. Our programmed identity, are the, that involves the programs that other people have had about us. These programs that we've been given about who we are and these programs that um, influence us as we go through life. Let me give you an example. I'm from a small town in Kentucky called Valley Station, Kentucky. I was brought up in a low-income, low-education environment. Um, I think my high school last year in the state of Kentucky ranked number three from the bottom in terms of academic achievement. So the odds on me being ranked as the world's number one leadership thinker as a child were very slim. However, I got a different set of programming from my mother that really sort of shaped my life. When I was growing up, my mother, my father had a small gasoline station back in Kentucky, a two-pump gasoline station, and we sold gasoline. And when I was growing up, it would have been very natural for me to come become involved in cars and in tools and mechanical things as opposed to academic things. However, when I was growing up, I got a very strong message of programming from my mother about who I was. To begin with, my mother said, you are smart. Now, she gave me this message almost from birth. You are smart. I was not told I was kind of smart or a little smart. She said, you are extremely smart. In fact, she said, Marshall, you are the smartest little boy in Valley Station, Kentucky. She said, also, you are going to college. This was never you might go to college or you could go to college. You are going to college. In fact, she said, you can go to graduate school. Now, again, almost nobody where I'm from ever got a PhD before. And she also said, Marshall, you have no mechanical skills, and you will never have any mechanical skills for the rest of your life. So when I'm brought up, I get this message about myself. I have no mechanical skills. I never think about it. How does this message impact my identity as I go through life? Well, I'm never encouraged to be around cars. I'm never encouraged to be around tools. I'm never encouraged to do any mechanical things. So what happened is I don't learn. Well, say I'm growing up, my friends think I have no mechanical skills. My father tells me I have no mechanical skills. So they're talking about tools and cars. I usually don't participate. Well, since I don't participate, I don't learn, and that further reinforces my identity that I have no mechanical skills. Then um, they're talking about tools. Someone discusses a universal joint. I think, what's a universal joint? Is that something people smoke? Well. I don't know anything. Well, as I grow older, I'm 18 years old, I take a test to go to the United States Army that was required of all the high school graduates called the United States Army Aptitude Test. Part of this test was called the Mechanical Aptitude Test. Another way to describe this Mechanical Aptitude Test was name that tool. They showed you pictures of little tools and you had to guess the names of the tools. On the United States Army Mechanical Aptitude Test, I scored in the bottom two percentile of the entire United States. I got a lower score than random chance. Well, now it was no longer my mother saying you have no mechanical skills, or my father, or my friends. It was the United States Army and a staff of trained psychologists all got together to prove I had no mechanical aptitude. And by the way, think of the name of that test. The test was called the mechanical aptitude test, not the mechanical ability test. Ability is kind of what we've achieved. Aptitude is what we are. 
So I got a very clear message. Not only do I have no mechanical skills, I was going to never have any mechanical skills because I had no mechanical aptitude. That's who I am. Well, it wasn't until I'm 26 years old that I'm getting my PhD at UCLA that I began to question this. I take a, a class from old Dr. Tannenbaum. And Dr. Tannenbaum hands out a piece of paper, and on one side he writes, things I do well. On the other, he writes, things I cannot do, and you have to fill this out. On the things I do well, what did I write? A smart, uh, good student, good researcher. What was I saying? Well, I am smart, smart, smart. Things I cannot do, what did I write? I have no mechanical skills. I will never have any mechanical skills for the rest of my life. Dr. Tannenbaum looks at me and he says, Marshall, how do you know you have no mechanical skills? I say, I took a test for the United States Army. I was defeated by random chance. It's hopeless. He said, how are your mathematical skills? I said, oh, I have excellent mathematical skills. Uh, I got a perfect score on the SAT math achievement test. I've taken nine courses of math past calculus. He said, why is it you can solve complex mathematical problems, but you cannot solve even simple mechanical problems? Well, I thought about that, and I thought that's an interesting question. He said, how is your hand-to-eye coordination? I said, I guess it's OK. I could uh, play pinball games and shoot pool and drink beer. He said, why is it you can play pinball games and you can shoot pool, but you cannot hammer nails? When I was 26 years old, I realized I had no mechanical skills because I'd been told I had no mechanical skills. That had been programmed into my identity and it became part of who I was as a human being. Now, as obvious as this story sounds, I see this in coaching every day. I coach leaders who say things like, I can't listen, I can't listen, I've never been able to listen, I can't listen. I look into their ears. I say, why can you not listen? Do you have something stuck in there? Or they'll say, uh, I can't give people recognition. I can't do it. Well, why not? Are you genetically mean? Well, we've just been programmed to believe we are a certain way. And these programs often just go through life in ways that are sometimes positive, such as you are smart, but sometimes dysfunctional, such as you have no mechanical skills. Now, if you're listening right now, I'm going to give you a little assignment. I want you to imagine that you're a little child and that your parents are talking about you with a friend and that your parents don't know you can hear them. And they say, little so-and-so is, and they start describing you. Write down the adjectives your parents would use to describe your, you. Then I want you to think about the adjectives you would use to describe yourself today. How similar and how different are they? And usually if they've changed, something pretty significant happened to cause this change. By the way, a lot of our identity comes from, if we have siblings, our siblings. I was an only child. My wife was an only child. So we really didn't have a lot of experience having siblings. But I found that if you have siblings, for people that do have siblings, a lot of their identity comes in relationship to that sibling, such as you're the pretty one, or the smart one, or the funny one, or something. And these often go through life in ways that really don't have to make much sense at all. Now, the final element of our identity is called our created identity. This is the identity that we can create for ourselves. And in my book, Mojo, I give an example of this from the rock star, Bono. One night, I had the, the good fortune of having dinner with Bono, the lead singer in the rock group U2, Irish fellow. Really nice man. Uh, I was not familiar with his music since most of it was recorded after 1975, but I had heard of him. We didn't discuss music, though. He discussed his identity. His original identity he talked about was regular guy, very much a regular fellow or a regular bloke. And, and you know, he's still very much a regular guy. He used the F word about 
uh, every other word in our discussion. And finally, he apologized. He said, sir, I'm sorry. I shouldn't use such bad language. I said, hey, I am from Valley Station, Kentucky. I thought the F word was the adjective that preceded all nouns. So I said, this really doesn't bother me very much. Well, he's still a very regular guy. I was very impressed. He doesn't put on airs. He's very humble. It seemed like a regular person. Then he became a rock and roll fan. And he talked about being a music fan and how he liked being a fan. And he still is a fan. He talked about the groups that he loved. Then he became a musician. And he's still a musician. Uh, not just to make money. He talked about playing music with his family on Sundays and his friends and how much he loved it. Then he became a rock star. And he's still a rock star. Uh, he's not a phony rock star. He wasn't showing off or bragging. He just talked about what it's like to be a rock star. And he is a rock star. That's who he is. And now he's a humanitarian. And he talked about being a humanitarian. And a lot of his life is really focused on helping poor people. Uh, I had the privilege of spending a week in Africa in 1984 with the Red Cross. And he was there as well. Turned out, and not exactly in the same place, but around the same time. And, and we both talked about the experience of going to Africa and how that influenced our lives. And a lot of his life now is creating a new identity of being a humanitarian. But this wasn't easy for him because people put him in a box. Many people said, um, well, you're just some phony rock star. You're not really a humanitarian. Or, you know, we get sick of these rock and roll people or these actors showing off or trying to, you know, run around, do things. And, he really didn't get a lot of positive reinforcement for being a humanitarian because people put him in the box of being a rock star. Well, to his credit, he said, forget it. If I want to help people, I don't have to apologize to anybody for trying to help others. If I'm raising money for poor people and donating my time for that, I don't have to apologize. I'm just going to go out and try to help people. And now I think he's pretty widely recognized as a great, not only a great rock star, he's recognized as a great humanitarian. Well, the learning point is we can all create a new identity. We can all create an identity that's different than the person we've been in the past. And we don't have to be locked into old programs. We don't have to be locked into what other people have told us. And we don't have to just be locked into what we can remember about ourselves. Now, the next element of identity I'm going to talk about is our reputation. While our identity is how we see ourselves, our reputation is how other people see us. And there's a common misconception in my work as an executive coach. In my work as an executive coach, I really stress the importance of follow-up. Leaders get feedback. They talk to people about what they learn. And they follow up on a regular basis. And when they engage in this systematic follow-up, almost invariably they're perceived as better leaders, not by themselves, but by everyone around them. And by the way, that is what I get paid for. Well, what's interesting is I'm often asked a question. Do people really change behavior, or are they merely perceived as changing because they do all of this follow-up? And the answer is the opposite of what you might believe. It is much easier to change behavior than it is to change other people's perception or our reputation. Why? One of the best research principles in psychology is called cognitive dissonance theory. We all see people in a manner that is consistent with our previous stereotype. And once we have a stereotype of someone, it is hard to change that stereotype. For example, if I believe that you are a bad listener, I am going to look for bad listener in whatever you do. And I'm going to see bad listener if I see any hint that you're not listening well. I'll use a simple example about changing perception, identity, changing behavior. Uh, let us imagine that you got 360 degree feedback. Let us imagine that your area for improvement is you make too many destructive comments about other people. Now, I pick that because it sounds so simple. You think, well, that's easy to change. I'll just quit making the destructive comments, and this reputation will go away. It's not so simple. Let us imagine I'm your coworker. You've received this feedback, but you do not talk to me about what you learn. You do not follow up. And you go seven months and never make a destructive comment about anyone. Seven months later, you say, stupid SOBs in finance, idiot bean counters, 
How do we get anything done in this company that's run by a bunch of stupid accountants? I hear you. My first reaction is you've never changed. That one comment will trigger my previous stereotype. And that one comment will lead me to, to think, wait a minute. This guy is just the way he has always been. My perception of your identity will go right back to where it was. Let us take a second situation where you get the same feedback. Only now you've said, I want to be a better team player. I don't want to be destructive. Only now I'm your coworker, and you come and talk to me. And you say, coworker Marshall, I have received this feedback. Uh, the feedback indicates that I make too many destructive comments about others. I need to be a better team player. If I have done this to you or the people around you, I am sorry. Um, can you please give me input? I want to really make an effort to do better. Well, although I may pretend to think this is interesting, on the inside I'm very skeptical. I don't believe you're going to change. In fact, when I coach people, I often tell my coaching clients, if you practice what I teach, your coworkers may well laugh at you behind your back. And then I say, and our family members may laugh at us behind our face. Well, what happens is we don't, nobody thinks we're going to change. Because their image of us, our identity, who we are, we often don't believe people can change. Now, what happens, though, when I follow up? Two months later, I go to the coworker and say, a Mr. Coworker. Two months ago, I said I wanted to be a positive and open-minded listener. It has been two months. Please give me some ideas for the next two months so that I can do better. Now I start thinking about I, I, I start thinking about the other person's behavior, and I say, you have done a great job. Now what happens? Not only has the behavior changed, the reputation begins to change. My perception of the other person changes. It's been four months. I say, it's been four months, Mr. The other person says, it has been four months, Mr. Coworker. I, I want to do a great job in terms of being a great team player, not destructive. Based on the last two months, give me ideas for the next two. And I say, well, great job. Then I say, it's been six months. Based on the last two months, give me ideas for the next two. Fantastic job. Now it's been seven months. I make a mistake. I say stupid SOVs and finance, idiot bean counters, how do we get anything done in this company that's run by a bunch of stupid accountants? The other person hears me. The other person says, you know what, it's been seven months you didn't do that. Or I say to the other person, it's been seven months you didn't do that. You made a mistake yesterday. You shouldn't have said that. The person says, I'm sorry. I'm going to apologize to the team. Situation A, did behavior change? Yes. Did perception change? No. Did reputation change? No. Situation B, did behavior change? Yes. Did perception change? Yes. In leadership, it does not matter what we said. In leadership, it only matters what they heard. So our reputation is not what we say. Our reputation is what they hear. And it's interesting to look at our identity two ways. One, how do I define myself? And two, how am I defined by others? And oftentimes, the way we are defined by others is not the same as the way we see ourselves. Now, my daughter, Dr. My daughter is Dr. Kelly Goldsmith. I am very proud of my daughter. She has uh, just won an award this week as one of the top faculty members at the Kellogg School of Management, Northwestern University. Uh, my daughter, um, graduate of Duke. Uh, got a PhD at Yale, and now she's a professor. Well, she gave me some help in this new research I'm doing. What we're doing is research on the area of employee engagement. And in our research, we do some fascinating things. We're trying to figure out how do we make people more engaged. Well, this is very, very interesting. How do I increase another person's engagement? And what we found out is I went to a presentation at the National Academy of Human Resources, where I'm a fellow. There was a lot of work done in the area of employee engagement. But everything focused on what the company can do to engage you. Nothing was focused on what you can do to engage yourself. I mean, everything they said was good. And I have no criticism with any of the things that people said. These are very smart people. But it was all about human resource programs, compensation plan. It was all about 
something somebody else is going to do to engage you, absolutely zero was done in terms of what you're going to do to engage yourself. Well, I'm listening to the presentation, and I thought about the two flight attendants. One's positive, motivated, upbeat, and enthusiastic. One's negative, bitter, angry, and cynical. You know what? They're on the same plane at the same time. What's the difference? It's not the outside. It's on the inside. Well, that led me to some new research on employee engagement and the use of something called passive questions versus active questions. Everything in employee engagement in the past has revolved around what I call passive questions. That's how meaningful is your work? How engaged are you? Um, do you have a friend at work? There's nothing wrong with passive questions, only when you ask people passive questions, they will invariably give you an environmentally based answer. Now, what does that mean? If you say, are you engaged? Well, I say, no. Well, why not? Uh, the boss is mean. Uh, the company has a bad pay system. There's something wrong out there. Our answers will almost invariably be environmental, not personal. Well, I've also been experimenting now with something called active questions. And the results have been amazing. We've done research now with over 1,000 people involving active questions in 10 different companies. We ask people on a regular basis to start evaluating themselves on six questions. Did I do my best to be happy? Did I do my best to find meaning? Did I do my best to build positive relationships? Did I do my best to set clear goals? And finally, did I do my best to make progress toward goal achievement? Excuse me. And finally, did I do my best to be engaged? Did I do my best? And what we find out is when people focus on themselves, everything gets better. The results have been amazing. We do research where we have people fill out a very simple questionnaire answering these six questions on a 1 to 10 scale every day. And just by the process of answering the questions, by the process of looking in the mirror, by the process of challenging ourselves to be happy, find meaning, to build positive relationships, to set clear goals, to make progress toward our goal achievement, and to be engaged, everything starts getting better. Why? We're not focusing on what the rest of the world is going to do to help us. We're focused on what we're going to do to help ourselves. We're not focused on, gee, I need the company to engage me. I start focusing on what I can do to engage myself. Now, one of the organizations we work with has been incredibly demoralized, uh, changing. And it's no one's fault. I mean, the people are good people, but it involves the government mortgage system in the United States. We had a huge housing crisis. They've had new leadership. The two that we found made the huge difference is when people ask, did I do my best to set clear goals? And did I do my best to make progress toward goal achievement? Everything got better. Why? These people were going to work just feeling lost. Then they realized, you know what? I'm going to be here eight or 10 hours anyway. I might as well make the best of it. I can't count on the company to give me clear goals, maybe, or I can't count on my boss. OK, so what? Am I doing my best to set clear goals? Am I doing my best to make progress toward goal achievement? And am I doing my best to make the biggest positive difference I can make, regardless of the company? Well, what's amazing is everything starts getting better. What I love about our new research is this. When you're on the three-hour flight on the airline, one flight attendant is positive and motivated motivated and enthusiastic, when it's negative, bitter, and angry. Well, on that American Airlines flight, the real loser for three hours is not American Airlines with that bitter flight attendant. American Airlines is bankrupt anyway. The real, there are thousands of flights. I mean, is it bad for American Airlines? Yes, but the real loser is not American Airlines. It's one tiny part of American Airlines. The real loser is not the customer. I have over 10 million frequent flyer miles. The customer is like a zombie in five minutes. The customer is not even paying attention. The real loser for three hours is the flight attendant. 
three hours of this person's life just got spent in misery, and it's not 100% of the customer's life or 100% of American Airlines' life. It's 100% of the flight attendant's life. Now, in our new research, when I've been teaching this, it's very exciting. I teach people this, and I say, look, is this good for your company? Yes. Is it good for your customer? Yes. It is better for you. Because when you're dissatisfied or angry, the real loser is not the company, it's you. And I use an example in my classes, and this is one I want you to think about for yourself. Imagine you have to go to a meeting, a boring meeting, stupid PowerPoint slides about finance. You don't want to go to the meeting. You're in a foul mood. If you knew you were going to get tested at the end of the meeting, not the company was going to get tested or your boss was going to get tested, you knew you were going to be tested on these six questions, which start with, did I do my best to be happy, find meaning, build positive relationships, set clear goals, make progress, and be engaged? How would you act different if you knew you were going to be tested, and would you act differently? I've asked thousands of people this question, and almost 100% say, I would act differently. Well, would the meeting be better or worse because you acted differently? They almost all say it would be better. Well, my advice is pretty simple. Start doing that. And let me give you a little test to take home. Every day, start evaluating yourself on, did I do my best to and answer these questions? And you know what you're going to find out? There's a very high probability your life is going to start getting better. Now, finally, the key theme that we talked about today is taking responsibility. What have I learned? Well, in leadership development, the key factor for success in leadership development is not the program. I'm going to talk when I work in Hungary about um, a, a session. I'm going to give research, research called Leadership as a Context Board. And the research is compelling. Same program, same speaker, same feedback form. Some leaders have huge improvements. Some leaders don't change at all. But the key variable is the leader. The leaders who take responsibility to develop themselves get better, and the ones that just sit there and act cynical don't change. If we look at our research on happiness and meaning, the key, the key person involved in your happiness and meaning is you. Our new research on employee engagement and our research on building relationships is real clear. The key variable is not listening to a seminar or reading a book or going to a class. The key variable is the person and really getting people to take responsibility. Take responsibility for own happiness, take responsibility for own meaning, take responsibility for own engagement, and basically just taking responsibility for our own lives. Now, I've gone just about 45 minutes, as just as we scheduled, and I'm really going to be looking forward to working with everyone when I do get to Budapest. But before that, we still have some time for questions. So I'm going to stop speaking now and turn it over to our host and see if we have any questions. Thank you so much, Marshall. Um, first of all, let me say thank you for that presentation. It was really thought-provoking and I think a great opportunity for self-reflection, which is uh, something that we don't get much of a chance to do in this incredibly busy and fast-paced world that we live in. So thank you for that. And uh, for all of our audience members, um, as Marshall indicated, we've got some time at the end for questions. So if you'd like to use the question function where you can type some questions questions in, I'll be selecting out some of those questions to, to put forward to Marshall. Um, but I might just kick off uh, with, with one of my own questions, uh, and it's about your work as an executive coach, Marshall. Um, yeah. We can just still see your screen there, so if you just want to go back I, I, to the... Uh, there we go. That's, that's it. That's better. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> so for my first question, uh, what's the most common barrier that you see when you're working as an executive coach that prevents executive progressing to the next level, and how do you overcome that barrier? Well, uh, I, in my book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, I talk a lot about that. And I talk about something called the success delusion. As we, you see the figure of the person climbing up the ladder. As we become more successful in life, we tend to fall into something called the superstition trap. What is the superstition trap? I behave this way. I am successful. Therefore, I must be successful because I behave this way. 
Well, any human, in fact, any animal will replicate behavior that is followed by positive reinforcement. The more successful we become, the more positive reinforcement we get in life, and the harder it gets for us to change. And the superstition trap is, I behave this way, I am successful. I must be successful because I behave this way. Wrong. Everyone I work with is mega successful. These people are CEOs or could be CEOs of huge organizations. They're all successful because they do many things right. And they're all successful in spite of doing some things that make absolutely no sense. And so I think we get confused with because of and in spite of. In my book, Mojo, I say our default reaction in life is not to be happy. Our default reaction in life is not to find meaning. Our default reaction in life is inertia. We all tend to go where we've been going. We do what we've been doing, and we say what we've been saying. It is incredibly difficult for any of us to fight the power of inertia. Brilliant. Thank you. I actually have a, a question from one of our audience members here about the revised approach to assessing employee engagement and whether or not that translates into better business results. And they've made you know, a good point. Start... Sorry, I well, just... It's, no. That's okay. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say they've made the brilliant point that uh, the survey results might get better, but does it actually make a difference to the outcomes of the organization? Well, it's a very good question, and there is a ton of research that's been done on employee engagement, not these studies, that show increased employee engagement leads to higher profitability, et cetera, et cetera. Our research, we're just getting started, obviously haven't proven that yet. I have shown it does lead to increased employee engagement. Other research has shown increased employee engagement leads to increased profitability, more commitment, and better customer satisfaction, which to me just makes sense. If you have two employees, one who's engaged, motivated, enthusiastic, and one who doesn't care, well, it's pretty hard to start rationalizing the one that doesn't care does just as good a job. Let me give you a guess, and this is strictly a guess, of when the kind of stuff I do makes the biggest difference and when it makes the smallest difference. My guess is if you're managing employees who engage in reasonably rote tasks, such as working on an assembly line, this stuff may not matter very much. On the other hand, if you're managing people who are doing something that involves creativity or, as Peter Drucker says, when you're managing knowledge workers who maybe know more about what they're doing, then employee engagement is critically important. The reason is a person's success or failure is a function of what they put into the task, and it's something that cannot be managed very easily. So if you look at employee engagement, the more the person becomes a knowledge worker, the more impactful the change in employee engagement becomes, because knowledge workers who don't care or are not motivated will not make a big difference. And the point is, you cannot make people care. So anyway, that was a very, very good question. I actually have a, a further question. I'm going to roll a question from two of our callers into one. Uh, how can you tell if someone is willing to change, and if someone is not willing to change, how can you convince leaders to be open to change if they may be afraid to, to lose face by, by showing their weaknesses to others? Well, again, that's multiple questions. Let me try to answer one at a time. In my coaching, everyone I coach has to get confidential feedback. They have to pick important behaviors to improve, and they have to follow up on a regular basis. I do not get paid if they don't get better. So if they refuse to do these, this work, I just don't work with them. Now, you might say as an internal person, well, that's nice for you to say, Marshall. I don't have that luxury. Maybe not. In GE, their internal human resource people rolled out my coaching process for high potential leaders. And this is published. If you want to see a copy, send me an email. Their results are just about as good as mine. And they used all internal coaches. Why? They didn't work with people who were unwilling to do the work. See, how do you know if people care? Well, it doesn't matter what people say. My coaching actually involves work. They have to get feedback. They have to pick important behavior to improve. They have to follow up over time on a regular basis. And if they refuse to do that, I just don't work with them. Now, I'm often asked a question, do leaders want to do the stuff I teach? And the answer is, I don't know. I only work with leaders who want to do this kind of thing. I'm not in the business of convincing people who do not care to start caring. 
So my answer to the second part of that question is I, I don't know. What percent of leaders are interested in trying to get better? I don't know because I have a degree in math. To answer that question, I would have to have a subset of all leaders. And I don't because all the people I work with do care or I don't work with them. So excellent question again. Brilliant, thank you. And uh, during the presentation, you talked quite a lot about your own personal experience. Could you give us an example of a time when your own identity changed? Very good question. Yes, I'll give you an example. I was a young PhD student at UCLA. Now, <laughs> I'm a little older than almost anyone on this call, probably, but you've got to, I don't know if any of you ever ter heard the term hippie. But back in the day, the late 60s, early 70s, I would have been defined as a hippie. My identity or self-image was I was hip and cool. I consider myself very profound and deep and above petty human interactions. And I, I, I go to get my PhD at UCLA. And I'm in a class with the same gentleman I talked about earlier, old Dr. Tannenbaum. And we're encouraged to talk about life. And we can discuss pretty much anything we want to talk about. And I talk about people in Los Angeles. And for three weeks, I talk about people in Los Angeles are plastic and materialistic. And they drive around in these you know, fancy Rolls Royce cars. And they wear $85 sequin blue jeans. And they're not really into deep things like, of course, obviously I thought I was. And by the way, since I am from Valley Station, Kentucky, obviously I consider myself the world's authority on people in Los Angeles. Well, after three weeks of my babbling, the old teacher, Dr. Tannenbaum, looked at me and he said, Marshall, who are you talking to? Well, I thought about it and I said, well, I guess I'm talking to the group. He said, who in the group are you talking to? I thought further, and I thought, well, I guess I'm talking to, to everyone. He said, Marshall, I don't know if you know this. Every time you have spoken, you have looked at only one person. You have seemed interested in the opinion of only one person. Who is that person? I thought about it, and I said, Dr. Tannenbaum, that's interesting. That would be you. He said, that's right, me. Now, Dr. Tannenbaum was the guru at the school, the most highly respected professor. He had the most widely read article ever published in the history of the Harvard Business Review. I looked at him and I said, you know, Dr. Tannenbaum, I think a person with your deep background and understanding can see the true wisdom of what I'm saying and how, how screwed up it is to go through life trying to impress people all the time. So old Dr. Tannenbaum looks at me, he scratches his beard, and he says, Marshall, is there any chance for the last three weeks all that you have been doing is trying to impress me? I said, well, no. I said, Dr. Tannenbaum, I am very disappointed. I think you have missed the significance of everything I've been saying. Well, I've just been talking about how screwed up it is to impress people. I think you've missed my whole point. He looked at me, scratched his beard, and goes, I think I understand. I look around the room. I see these ten heads nodding. I hated old Dr. Tannenbaum's guts for six months. Six months later, I looked in the mirror, and I said, thank you, Dr. Tannenbaum. You have just taught me a great lesson, sir. Well, I learned a great lesson. Sometimes other people can see things in us that we cannot see in ourselves. And when this happens, our first reaction is, they are wrong. They are confused. Well, sometimes they are not wrong at all, and they are not confused. Sometimes we are wrong, and we are confused. Well, that one incident really shaped my life. And now that's what I do for a living. I give leaders feedback, and I tell them what everyone thinks about them. And you know what? A lot of times what I tell them is not what they think. It is different from the way they define themselves or their own identities. And it is hard. It is hard to hear this. And I try to use that example as a time in my own life when I had to confront my own little pompous identity 
and realize that, you know what, there are elements of myself I didn't like. And I was very gifted at seeing what I didn't like in myself and other people. I was not nearly so gifted at seeing what I didn't like in myself, in myself. Brilliant. Thank you for that answer. It was very, very uh, inspiring, actually, and, and thought-provoking, as I said before. I think we have time for one more question. I, I apologize to, to everybody if your, your own question wasn't answered, but we've been absolutely flooded. Uh, but for the final question, let's, let's turn to leadership development, because as I mentioned, you are the number one leadership thinker in the world. So leadership development has been has been a topic of conversation for such a long time now, but why is it still so difficult to implement, particularly in big organizations? Well, I think one of the real problems with leadership development is we have focused on the program, not the person. And what we've done is made an assumption, if I teach a great program, everyone will get better. Well, my research is very, very counter to that. My research shows that the key variable isn't the program, it's the person. And what we really need to start doing is getting leaders to measure their own success, their own, and getting input from everyone around them on a regular basis so they take responsibility for their own development as opposed to sitting there learning to critique programs. If you look at my research, the key variable in successful leadership development is not the program, it's the leader. Yet, if you look at any leadership program, there's almost no follow-up after the program. So what happens is people critique the speaker. Sometimes I say, was the food tasty? And sometimes I say, was the room nice? Well, the people who've been trained, or the speaker has been trained, the cook is being trained, and the janitor is being trained. We're not really focusing on the leaders taking responsibility for their own behavior, and the leaders are taking responsibility for their own development. So I guess the key thing I've learned in leadership development is very powerful, compare, and it's like employee engagement, and it's like personal relationships. We need to get people to look in the mirror and to work. We need to get people to take responsibility for their own development, their own engagement, and if we do that, there's a high probability they're going to get better. If we don't, they can go to courses till hell freezes over. It'll make no difference. Brilliant, excellent point there, and I think that's a, a great point to wrap up on. So I, I just want to thank you again, uh, Dr. Marshall Goldsmith, for your time today and your, your brilliant insights, and thank you to everybody who's joined us today as well, and you will receive an email with the recording of the presentation after afterwards too. You can see on your screen there some information uh, about the events that Dr. Marshall Goldsmith will be presenting at for us in November in Budapest. Hungary. So if you're able to join us, then we would love to welcome you along and, and uh, give you the opportunity to meet Marshall in person and pose some of these questions to him yourselves. So thank you all very much for today and, uh, and have a, an excellent rest of the day. Thank you all. Thank bye you. Bye.